I'm not really ready yet. I'm a little distracted. All right, today, let's see. Um, we're going to start off talking about, actually, I can control this over here, can I? Um, boop, maybe. Uh, some announcements. Um, so there's another announcement that I can't remember. So if it comes to me, I will make it midway through. Um, but so if you have any questions about the review guide assignment, now is a good time. Is anybody having any trouble with it or conceptually or otherwise? All right. Uh, just a reminder, we put the wrong date on the original uh, deadline. Um, it's not going to be very useful. I think the original deadline went in after the midterm. Um, so that was even less useful. Um, so yeah, I don't know what my fingers were thinking. Um, the first project uh, will be kind of assigned, you know, get released or whatever on Thursday. Uh, and you have about two weeks to do it. Um, but it's, uh, it has a checkpoint. So it's, it's kind of like two assignments, but basically we want to see how you're doing halfway through, um, you know, before uh, you kind of get to the end and are in trouble. Um, you remember you can work with one other person on this, um, preferably from your team, from the discussion group, but it doesn't have to be, um, you know, but you also can't use your whole group. So you just use one other person for the project um, and then you can submit it together once you get the grade scope. Um, so you only have to submit one for the pair of you. You also don't have to work with anyone else. You don't want to. Um, a reminder again, the accommodations. I don't think I've seen any. So if, uh, if I am mistaken, uh, please uh, remind me, make me notice. Uh, email sometimes defeats me. All right, any questions? All right, so uh, last time we talked a little bit about density. Um, but I didn't feel like I did a good job of it. So I want to cover it a little bit again. Um, so I, I find this kind of terminology a little weird. Um, so in technology, we tend to use the term density a lot, okay? Um, and it generally kind of means the same thing where it means like how much, you know, how much can you get into a space, right? So it might be, and I think I might use this example before, so it might be RAM or it might be uh, CPU or whatever. Um, so, but it could also be like stuff, right? And in this case, I'm just kind of, you know, we were using examples of the bins from last time, right? So the height measures the density of that bin, okay? So this bin, right? And this bin are the same, okay? Because they, I mean, well, these are all the same, actually. I, I meant to concentrate on this one, but you know, so it's lower in height, but because it's wider, it's the same, right? And so this is a peculiar, peculiar function of uh, histograms, kind of more so than bar charts. Okay, so histograms, the area matters, right? It's not just the height, uh, like it would be on a bar graph. You know, uh, you know, often you do bar graphs, you know, tall, but sometimes they go wide. Uh, so it just matters on a histogram, the whole area. Um, and you can use that to um, kind of discover other kind of elements about the bin, right? Uh, by knowing about the area. And so, you know, if you remember, does anybody know how to calculate the area of a square? Yeah. Yeah, so length and width. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, but so as a result, you can get to the density very easily. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, like I said, it's kind of one of those keywords. So that's why I bring it up again. Um, you know, I think from a gut instinct perspective, I think it's pretty obvious, but you know, we want to explain it so you know what kind of the rationale is behind it as well. Um, all right. Uh, and then we can, sorry, I thought it was, I was on this slide, but so the area measures the percent. So you can get to how many individuals are in the bin and then how crowded it is, right, based on the height. Okay. Like I said, it should be mostly review, but I wanted to cover it again. All right, any questions? All right, cool. Um, just a little review of charts. We've kind of gone over them the last few sessions. Um, so we have a scatter plot, which is what you use, allows you to compare two sets of numbers, right? Um, so, and we have uh, some more interesting scatter plots, I think, next time. Um, 
but you know that's kind of the use case right uh then a line graph right so it's just like a line uh you know which is when you want to do a different kind of uh evaluation so usually over something like time um you know so you'll be measuring something on the y-axis and then something like time over the x-axis in a sense it's the same two numerical values sort of right except um they're they're more consistently over time or you know space or something like that um and then oh the other thing is that you know a scatter plot is it's important to kind of see the whole like cloud in a sense whereas a line graph you know kind of limits the kind of data you can put into it because it's got to all be on the line right um a bar chart distribution of categorical data and then a histogram distribution of numerical data okay like I have said a number of times, I feel like a histogram and a bar chart are very, very similar. Um, you know, you're kind of turning numerical data into categorical data when you use a histogram. So now for some questions. All right, so what kind of chart would you use to answer that question? Are there more cloudy days than sunny days? And here's the data, by the way, or at least a sample. Hopefully you can read it. Not that it matters, but. All right, so what kind of chart would you use for this? Hands, anybody? Okay, we have three at once, that's good. Bar chart, uh, yeah, so bar chart. Um, and what does anybody remember what function you would use uh in order to get the data into a situation where it would be useful to get a bar chart covered it a little bit last time i think maybe it was time before that yeah go ahead so okay so you could take a mean except it's categorical data right um so what you're trying to do is you're trying to turn this into a number right to get a bar chart right so how would you turn this into a number bins no no because this is this isn't a number bins would be for over here right um yeah go ahead. a group so remember when you use a group on it what it's going to essentially do and let's just say for the sake of argument, the only kinds of sky conditions there are cloudy and sunny. Um, so what it's gonna do is just count all the cloudies and count all the sunnies, right? And then you're gonna get a bar graph, which has you know the cloudy day line, right? And then the earth bar, and then the sunny day bar, right? And then you'll be able to see which one's longer or tall, depending on which way you want. Does that make sense? Nods? All right, all right, cool. Uh, and because lately I am loving the build slides. Uh, all right, so how would we answer that question? What percentage of days uh, have a high above 75 degrees? Uh, if you hadn't guessed, this is in Fahrenheit, it'd be very, very uncomfortable if it wasn't. Either Kelvin or Celsius. Uh, any ideas? All right, well, what kind of data is it? Right, so we want highs, which is this column here. What kind of data is this? Now, back up. So, what, just what kind of data is this that's in this column? Numerical. And then, what do we typically use numerical data with? What kind of gra uh, graph? Histogram? Yeah. Um, sorry, I couldn't tell who was talking, the, not being able to see lips move. Um, right, a histogram. So uh, because we're using, we're looking at numerical data, right? So what we're going to want to do is have some bins, right? Uh, does anybody have any ideas what those bins should be? If we want to answer that question. Yeah. Right, so so you're probably gonna to want to do like a min and max, right? Or at least a max, um, you know? And so basically, actually you probably need both because you have to kind of define both sides of the bin, 
but the answer is two bids, right? Is the easiest way to do this to answer that particular question. It's not going to help you if you also want to know high above 70, right? But you just have two bins, one that goes from the min to 74, right? Um, or 75, right? Because it's not inclusive. And then one that goes 75 to whatever the max is, okay? Max plus one, actually, right? Because we want the 75, which is inclusive, and then we want the max um, plus one so that we get all the digits or all the entries, right? Because otherwise the max would be one less than that. That makes sense? So with two bins, then we could say, okay, now everything that's below 75 will be in one, everything below 75 will be in the other, and then we can um, get a percentage uh, based on the area, right? All right, let's try the next one. Do hotter days tend to also have hotter nights? Um, and so what kind of graph would we use uh, to figure that out? Any ideas? Scatter plot. That's a good guess. Uh, and, and the correct answer. Sorry, not just a guess. Um, okay, so what would we put on our axes in order for the scatter plot uh, to work right? Yeah, so, and actually, maybe, I don't know. Uh, how many people here know what high and low mean here? Oh, this might be a little bit of a problem. Okay, so uh, when you're uh, reporting on the weather, um, the high is the highest temperature it will be in a 24-hour period, okay? And the low is the lowest temperature it'll be in, in a 24-hour period. So the lows usually happen at night, but not always, but usually, right? And the highs usually happen during the day, okay? So essentially what you said, except we plot highs on one side and lows on the other, and then we look for... Um, that scatter to basically be kind of going up and to the right, right? So we kind of like, instead of just like a round cloud or something, we would have one that's kind of elongated and it would, it would tell us that a hotter, and you know, I'm guessing, right? Most of the time, hotter days usually equal hotter night. Um, so, and that's why we'd use the highs and lows. So apologies if there wasn't enough setup on that. Um, this is the problem when you make assumptions about what people know. Uh, all right. So let's see, I think that was my last one. So now we are going to do a demo. Maybe, hopefully, forgot to reload this. Oh, this is, oh there it is. Thinking, thinking. All right. Oh, I really didn't set this up right. Sorry, I totally thought this was all loaded. Hold on one second. Um, if you want to follow along, there should be uh, the usual in the materials. So, all right, so today uh, we're going to kind of review some of those, uh, what should I call it, graphs again, uh, except this time we're going to use the survey data that you filled out. Um, it's not as interesting as it could be because we had about 30-ish responses, uh, as you might imagine. Um, oh, oops. Should work better while well, it thinks. Apparently, the uh, hamsters need to be kicked. Um, all right. So, I didn't include all the data that we collected, um, just the handedness. Okay, so right or left handed. Um, then, sleep sides, uh, you know, we're backing some of your coarser sides somehow. Uh, text keys and then Python skill. This is the uh, how do you feel with Python now, I think. Um, and then number of sleep hours. Okay. So this is the kind of data we got. So we can start to look at some things that might be fun. Um, so the first thing we might want to do is find out how much data we have. Um, 
you know, we can, we can nap it out up there, right? But we, it's usually a good idea to kind of have it hanging around um, because you often need it to figure out uh, various things. Um, so as I said, there's about 30, uh, or there's exactly 30 respondents. Um, one of them is me, in fact. Um, Graham, I don't know if you filled it out. Uh, so uh, one is me as well as, you know, most of you. Uh, so what do you think? So any guesses as to how many left-handed people there are versus right-handed people? You think there's more left-handed people than right-handed? All right, good guess. Uh, I was actually surprised it's very low. It's only two people who are left-handed. Um, I was honestly a little surprised. Um, I thought the incidence was slightly higher, but does that tell you anything about the survey, the quality of our survey? The fact that I feel like it's low compared to general population? Any ideas? Exactly. So the quality of your data has a lot to do with the size of the uh, like rows, right? Or the number of rows. So when it's really small, you will get, you know, kind of outliers sometimes looking like important things. Um, and sometimes you'll diminish the importance of, um, you know, kind of the core, right? So we do know, generally speaking, in the population, right-handed people are much more common than left-handed, but I thought it was like five or 10%. Um, and that seems a lot less than that, right? Um, okay, so, but then we wanna be able to look at uh, this in a, like a simpler fashion. Okay, so we're gonna do a bar graph, um, not there, over here. So that we can easily see the difference, right? So, um, you know, it's a little easier when these numbers are a lot higher. Um, you know, it's easier, it's often easier to compare, uh, you know, the graphs than it is to compare the actual digits. So we would use a bar, uh, you know, again, still using it horizontally. Um, um, in this case, we probably actually didn't need to. I think it's just bar, right? Let's see. Oh, so, oh, yeah, I also have a bug. I, I need to figure out, I haven't figured out. Um, okay, so bar chart, uh, the horizontal one is still definitely better, um, but then we can keep going and let's talk about the Python skill. So what's the difference between the handedness and Python skill uh, in terms of the data? All right, why did we use a bar chart? Categorical, yeah, exactly. So that data was categorical. The Python skill was a scale of uh, one to five or zero to five. Um, so in this case, we're gonna to wanna to use a histogram. Um, and as you can see, uh, what I thought was kind of interesting is that we end up with, have you ever, uh, how many people here know what a bell curve is? Hands? All right, anybody who's got their hand up wanna explain what a bell curve is? Go ahead. Right, so, so kind of like this graphic, except let's say more pronounced, but basically if you look at it, it looks like a bell, okay? Or what, you know, kind of an iconic bell rather than necessarily a real one. Um, and so what that tells you is like, the distribution of the of the whatever across all the samples that you get will tend to be higher in the middle, right? And then uh, you know fewer of them on the outlying edges. So in this example, the middle, right, is like people are roughly comfortable with Python. It's very comfortable with Python, not very comfortable with Python, right? So um, we have a few people who are not very comfortable, and a few people who are very comfortable. And then a lot more in the middle. Does that make sense? And if you think about it, right, like most of the time when you do stuff like this, that it's kind of what you expect, right? Is that kind of distribution? It's not always true, but it is useful to, to keep that in mind. And if it's not a bell curve, um, that can also be very interesting. All right. So 
This one I thought was interesting too. Anybody have any, any theories on the range for sleep hours? Like what's the smallest number of uh, sleeping hours and what's the largest? What do you think, smallest, what do you all think? Raise your hand if you think it's uh, four hours. Three hours, five hours, six. All right. What about the tall or the highest? Let's say uh, twelve. I mean, I think it's twelve hours. No. Uh, one of the examples I saw was one of them was sixteen. Uh, I was like, that's impressive. Uh, all right. What about eleven for the high side? No. You, you you're confident that everyone works too hard for that. Ten. Uh, all right. Let's see. So it looks like you're pretty close to right, five to nine. Um, but again, so we have a histogram here, right? So you got to take into account the width, um, which is, yeah, so here, right here, here. Um, so, but again, kind of bell-ish, right? We have a lot more in the center uh, with six or seven hours. Um, and, uh, one of the, there's been a lot of studies about this, about like how much sleep you should get. Uh, it's worth looking into, especially if you hate sleeping or really enjoy sleeping. Um, I'm on the hate sleeping side of the fence, uh, but I probably should sleep more. Um, so I figure I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? So, so yeah, just some kind of fun data about, you know, about the class. Um, but then we can start to do some other things, right? So if we start to pull out some of the data, then we can say, okay, what's the maximum number of sleep hours? Um, as you can all probably tell, right? We know what it is, it's nine. And then the lowest, and then we get five for that. We're using the max and the min to make it easy. Um, and then can anybody tell me why we use uh, why do we use columns there off the surface? What's the property of that that we care about for max and min? Anybody? Yeah. Because it returns an array. Um, so, and what does min take? An array. So we can find that easily out, right, by doing type, um, and we find that it's an array. So then we can do, let's see, oh, I forgot one thing I want to do, which is, all right, so instead of, like, we want to make, um, I honestly, I expected a slightly wider variation. So these bins are a little um, small. But as you can see here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's make some bins um, that step by two, right? So we take the minimum that we found earlier, okay, so that's a five. Then we do the max, which was the nine, but then we have to add one, right? So to make it inclusive, and we do a, a step two. So in other words, we'll do a, you know, a five, a seven, a nine bucket, all right? But so then what we can say is, okay, um, does the side you sleep on indicate how much you sleep, right? Do you sleep better if you sleep on the left side or do you sleep better if you sleep on the right side? Um, I can also do stomach and back, but I figured two is enough. All right, so I thought this was interesting. Um, it appears that it's really about the same. Um, you know, there's a slight difference here, um, but uh, the distribution is, is really pretty consistent. Uh, I kind of expected that, you know, this is, this is kind of a wild correlation, right? Like, is there any actual relationship here? Right. Um, but I expected it to be a little bit crazier than this output uh, seems to be. Um, but really what I want to point out to you is you can kind of, you know, keep cascading these pieces of data together so that you can actually make, you know, a nice graph with the whole set. So what we do is we say, um, get all the, the people who are sleeping on the right side um, and then take the sleep hours with the bins we made it before and then create a plot that will uh, show those next to each other or show those combined i guess 
All right, any questions? All right, we can fool with that because, right, they're numerical data, we can put them in bins um, and play around with the data that way. I think there's one, is there one other thing? Um, no, okay. So, hey. All right, so now we're gonna move on to functions. Um, and all right, so does anybody remember, we talked about functions a little bit before, all right, but I wanna go into, so this is kind of like the formal definition of it, right? But so a function is very much like a variable, right? It's just a name attached to something. So instead of the name being attached to a number, right? Or a string or something like that, it's actually attached to a piece of code. So, but much like that name that is attached to a number, in the case of a function, we can kind of reuse it anywhere we need that batch of code, okay? Um, and usually from a life perspective, right, it's a lot simpler that you can change that block of code in one place uh, and have it affect all places that it's used. So you don't have to go find everywhere that you made a spread function. All right, so, The name of the function is this word. Um, the reason can y'all, I don't know, hopefully y'all can see these colors. The reason I chose the colors that they're in is because the text editor I use um, shows them in this color. So if you have syntax highlighting, you'll usually see keywords in one color, okay? Names of things in another color. Um, and then every kind of everything else in a third color. And then you'll have some other uh, things as well. Um, all right, so then we have the argument names. So we've ultimately, or uh, we kind of talked about those as being arguments and parameters. Um, have we used any other words for those things? Okay, so that's the arguments. And then we have what's referred to as the method body or the function body, okay, which is that part. And then lastly, uh, there's this part. Basically, it's whatever is to the right of the return is the return expression, okay? Or return value sometimes. Um, it's, it's often referred to as a return value if it's just like a static value, right? And an expression if there's an expression instead of just like an answer. Um, so does anybody here know what uh, a spread is? Sports metaphor or stock market? Or let me know what a spread is. Really, you've never seen this term? Okay, so spread is basically the distance between the max and the min. Okay, so um, for example, with stock market, uh, you look at today's trading for you know GameStop, and its spread was you know given GameStop's volatility the last several months, um, you know it was a thousand dollars. I don't know, but more typically you might have a spread on a stock that's a few bucks, um, you know, depending on the stock and depending on what it's doing. Uh, spread is also used in sports, primarily in betting. Uh, when you <clears throat> take a football game and you have, you actually bet on the spread between the, sport, the points scored by one team and the points scored by the other team. So it doesn't matter if the scores were, you know, if, if you're talking about soccer, uh, which is the kind of fo football I normally care about, um, you know, a score is two and four, right? The spread is two, but it's the same spread if the score was six and eight. So you still win because the spread is two. That makes sense? So uh, I have, I don't think ever done any sports betting for real. I just like numbers. So um, that's why I know how this works, but it's just a little function. And given how much all of you knew about a spread function, this is a great thing to put in a method, right? Because then you can have the one person in your team who knows how to do a spread, write that method, and then let everybody else use it. And then if, you know, if I make a mistake, right? Maybe I reverse them in the max or something, um, I can come back to that one place and fix it. And now it's fixed for everybody, right? Um, so, is there really a demo next? Yes. Um, so we have, do, do, do. all 
can we read this today? Is this good enough size wise? Can we go up? Okay. Um, all right. So here we're going to make a really simple function. Okay. Uh, it's called triple because that's what it does. Um, and it basically returns three um, times whatever it was you sent in. So I have to execute that, right? I have to make sure that uh, the rest of this notebook knows about triple. And we're going to talk about some of the problems with that in a second. Um, so what is triple three going to do? Yeah. What's the, what's the output going to be? Right. All right. Um, and then we can also use it with variables. Um, like I said, we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, but then we can also do, and you know, like I said, I like to talk about this in terms of you know the rules of uh, like mathematics of how these things happen, right? So in this case, we're going to multiply the number or you know the num right, which is four times five before we pass it through, right? Because it's almost like order of operations if you think about the parentheses as they do in math. All right, so then we multiply it. Uh, you know, so four times five, yeah, four times five, and then triple that uh, is six. All right, making sense, everybody? All right. Hopefully, we've talked about this a bit already, and so it's easy. Um, all right, what's going to happen if I execute this statement? The one I'm on, I can't read the numbers. What's going to happen? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to point out though is that up here we did define an X, right? Sorry. So the answer that it's going to give an error is correct. Okay. And this is what we refer to as scope. Okay. Um, I don't know. I can't think of the English word. Um, so a scope is where something is kind of good for, okay? So before I ran this def triple function up here, right? Triple wasn't in the scope of this notebook, okay? So the notebook didn't know anything about it. Like, what are you talking about? Um, as soon as I define it, now the notebook has a scope that includes triple, all right? Does that make sense? All right, so it's basically like the bounding box. Then in turn, the function triple also has a scope where it defines X. Okay, so it's got a purpose for the letter X, but it's only valid inside that method. All right. So that's why this X down here is unknown because we're back in the notebook scope, not in the triple function scope, right? We're in the outside of it. You can have them inside, but that doesn't mean they bleed through to the outside. They're always on the inside. All right. So as a result, X doesn't exist. Um, but then if we do X equals five, now this will work, right? And, but what happens if I do triple two times X? So what's gonna happen there? Anyone? Ideas? It'll return 30. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. However, what is X? So if I, if I execute X now, is X going to be the result of two times five, right? So 10. Will it be five? Will be something else. Five, right. So messing with the scope, okay? So if we're inside the scope of triple, does not mess with the scope of the outside and vice versa. So I can't touch anything inside the scope, but that inside the scope also can't touch anything on the outside. Um, and this does come with a caveat usually. Okay, there are scenarios where you can you can mess with that because you want to. 
um, but that is for a much later class. Ah, so like if we do this, right? So then we get 60, right? Now what's X? Still five. Is that what you meant? Yeah. yeah. So the fact that we use X in the statement itself, does that modify what happens on the inside or on the outside? And no, it does not. Okay. Because like the order of operations thing, right? The multiplication takes place before it's passed in. As far as triple is concerned, there's no such thing as the X that came from the notebook scope. It only got the value of it. Okay. In fact, this is in computer science referred to as passing by value. Okay. Uh, that will probably not be on any tests that we do in this class. Um, all right, so Python, unlike some languages, uh, is also what uh, here is referred to as type agnostic. Okay, does anybody know what agnostic means? Any theologians? Because that would be particularly funny. Yeah. Non-believer, it's actually not quite that. It's more like, um, so agnostic means you believe in God, but not in a religion. So in, in other words, anything will do, okay? So type agnostic means any type will do, okay? Um, so what that means, oh boy, what that means we can do is, and you've seen this play with this before, we can actually pass in a string to triple, okay? And what's going to happen? Does anybody remember? You're going to get three three ha's, right? Um, it'd be funny if it reversed it and became ah ha ha, but you know whatever. Um, so that's you know, so it's type agnostic. You can pass whatever you want there. Some things will make sense and work, and some things won't make sense and will throw an error. Um, so. This has the advantage of I can do weird stuff like this. This has the disadvantage of I can do weird things like this. Okay. So you always have to be aware of your types because nobody's checking for it. Okay. And there is much, much debate in the programming language, like, uh, you know, super nerd community about which type is better, like whether you should care about types or whether you shouldn't. Um, Python takes very strongly the opinion that types are not generally important. Okay, and when you're talking about a thing like a Jupyter notebook, they really aren't right, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to say X is a number and then turn it into you know a string of letters and then you know something else, because I'm actually just doing something in a kind of cascade right i'm just kind of building and building and building because i'm exploring something or whatever things like types kind of get in the way of that types are usually. Um, you know can be really important, especially when you're working as groups right you're doing a big software project and you have a bunch of different teams and you want to agree on uh how things talk to each other types can be really helpful but for languages like python a lot of the times a lot of the scenarios that most of you will be in type agnostic is much easier um let's see oh yeah and sorry here's another cool example um actually here we'll ask the we'll ask the crowd even though y'all are not very awake today what else could we pass to triple that might be fun? I know it's raining out. Maybe it'll be bright and sunny when we're done. I gotta wake you all up. All right, any other? Right? Yeah, go ahead. An array, right? So what's gonna happen with an array? Or do you expect? It'll what? Right. And that will conveniently lead to our next piece, I think. So I did an NP array, A range, right? So, and that'll give me zero to four, not inclusive. Uh, and so then, like I said, it's gonna do that first, it's gonna create that array. Then it's gonna pass it into triple, then triple is gonna do the multiplication, except because it's an array, it's gonna step through each element of the array and multiply it by two, right? All right, so next we'll talk about this function. Um, so any theories about 
what this would do, like what I would do this, uh, you know, like what would I pass to this or how I would make this work, how it might be useful. If I move too far over, I can't see because I get blinded by the camera. Do you have an answer over there? I thought, I, did you raise your hand? Okay. All right, what do you what do you think? What's the what do you expect the parameter I'd want to pass into the application? So if I pass a single number, what do you think will happen? Let me run it first so that it's aware. All right, so All right, so what happens if I pass in a 10? What do you think? 100? Not too much. Because I'm trying to do, right? Did I do that right? Yeah. So uh, because some takes an array, okay? I can't pass in a single number because what would I be summing, right? Um, this is the kind of thing where, like, you have to kind of look up your methods sometimes, right? Um, because I, at least, would expect some, if I pass in a single digit or number, to send me back the same number, right? Um, so you have to know how they work. Uh, so in this case, we need an array. So what if we do NP range? Uh, let's do eight. Um, You think this will work? All right. So, can anybody tell me what they think that is that we got back? All right. So, we know what we said in, right? We said in zero, one, you know, all the way up to seven, right? So, what do you think that is, the values that we got back? Yeah. Well, what's the total? Right. So if you take all the numbers zero to seven, sum them, okay, then take the percent that the four is of that total. All right. So let's see. Seven and three is 10. I don't know. Math. Uh, let's see. So one plus two plus three plus four plus five. I'm actually typing that right. Nope. I have an equal sign there. Oh my God, I can't use the computer. Got it. All right, so I can't do that. All right, so twenty eight. So, um, so zero is obviously zero percent, then one is three and a half percent, and then two is seven percent of the uh, the total amount. Okay. So that number, how much of it is the, of the total 28? All right. So I don't know, stupid little function might come in handy uh, when you might need the percent of total. Obviously, uh, a string, you know, kind of an A range set of numbers is pretty uncommon, um, but you might, it might be a lot more useful if you wanted to do um, let's say we had make array um, you know 10 33 12 uh, 88 you know 101 uh, 2 right so if we had a bunch of friends, right? Yeah. So if we had a bunch of arbitrary numbers, right, that were coming out of something, um, just trying to have a good example. Um, you know, or maybe going back to the stock market example, right? If you own a bunch of uh, stocks and, you know, uh, one set of stocks is worth $10, another one's $33, et cetera, you want to know how much of stock A 
is your portfolio total, right? And so that's when something like this might be useful. So stock A is 4% of your overall stock portfolio in dollars, right? Um, because obviously, or it could also be a listing of shares and it would give you the same thing. Um, okay, so another common example is uh, Pythagoras' theorem. So if we wanted to make that, let's say we start with something like that, right? So we can get the hypotenuse. Um, does anybody know how we could uh, then calculate, excuse me, um, the hypotenuse? You can type and then read it back to me. You have an answer. All right, let's give it, let's see if we can get a couple other people. Raise your hand when you think you have a, a decent answer. All right, you haven't said anything today. How about you tell us an answer? Okay, um, we're going to throw that in the trash right now, though, right? Um, so this is a common one. Um, so just kind of a quick sidebar. So remember, I was talking about return expressions. Um, in my experience, it's often a pretty bad form in uh, like maintainability and cleanliness and that kind of stuff to put the expression directly in the return line, unless it's really, really simple, okay? So generally speaking, we'll have some sort of variable that you kind of shove the result into, and then you pass that variable back, then it's easier for like the next person comes along to modify it before it shifts, right? Um, so uh, I used to use ret val a lot as the name of it. Uh, I often will use out now because it's the value I'm gonna pass out. Um, so, and I don't use the word output because in a lot of languages, that's actually a reserved word. Uh, so I usually use something like out. Um, so little sidebar. All right, does anybody have any comments on this? Do you think it's gonna work? Uh, let's see. Probably be more likely to work now. Comments, theories, look good? All right, let's see. I thought it was still thinking. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, so hypotenuse, great. Uh, this will, this as per typical in most um, kind of any kind of programming you, you do in college, you will probably never use this function ever in your life. Uh, if you work in software, you know, or data science or whatever, um, you know, <laughs> this is like too mathy for, for most of the scenarios you kind of run into unless you're doing really specific uh, things. Um, so you're much more likely to get to be, you know, using things like triple or spread or things like that. Um, but it's kind of a good example because it's a little bit hard. Um, and so then we have, uh, right, isn't this, a, isn't this typical? I think it's like a common triangle. I don't know, it's been a long time since I've been in college too. Um, so long story short, you know, we can wrap that function up, you know, we can make them uh, reusable and we can go back and edit them if we make mistakes. Um, you know, uh, and like I said, I tend to split out the, the expression from the result 
because now if you look at it right, if somebody wanted to go, I don't know, maybe they always want the absolute value or something. Um, they can easily add that line in without having to worry about messing up the actual expression. Does that make sense? So that's kind of why, that's part of why I do it. It's also, I think it's more readable. Um, all right, so that was that little example. Um, but what I wanted to show you next was, um, and, and this may stand a reason, right? But the functions we've been using are just the same, right? So here is make array. This is the actual source code for the actual one you're using. Uh, it's the latest version. We may not be using the exact latest version. Um, if you notice this whole thing, well, or sorry, this whole thing up here, that's all documentation, right? And then down here, this is the part where it actually starts doing some code. So whether you can read the code or not, right? What I just kind of want to point out is it's exactly the same. Everything's kind of defined all the way back. Um, you know, we won't get into some of the weirdness of Python that you can actually see um, today. But, and then, so we also have the more complicated, this is the thing that actually generates those scatter graphs, right? Or scatter plot graphs. Um, and this is the one I was originally thinking of, you know, so, and that's why you can tell GitHub does uh, some syntax out of it. So, but all of this blue, that's all documentation telling you what it does, okay? Um, the nice thing about Python is that if you write your comments like this, um, they show up in most editors uh, when you try to find out about that function. It also generates, uh, uh, when the link that Graham put on Piazza about the, you know, if you want to look up uh, all the functions that hang off the table, for example, um, they actually generate that as well from this documentation. So you only have to have it in one place. But as you go down here, as you can see, this one's pretty complicated. Um, but at the end of the day, it's exactly the same. Um, the only thing is, like this one doesn't actually have a return value, probably. Um, so because all it does is print that graph, right? It doesn't return anything. And if you remember from a class or two ago, we actually ran a type against it, and we got a none type. That's because it doesn't return. I mean, it does return something. It returns none, um, so nothing useful. Whereas Maker A returns, intuitively enough, the array, right? Um, and obviously, there's lots of other methods and stuff that can call in there. Uh, but the point just being is that this is on GitHub. This is one of the lovely things about open source: is that if you wanted to know how to write, write your own Maker array function. You could just go find this source, go take a look at it. And if you wanted to modify it, you could. Or if you want to modify it for everyone, you can push the code back to them, making what's called a pull request, and say, here's a suggestion for something that I think would be better. And then they can say yes or no or whatever. But you can just go see examples anytime you want of other people's code. All right. Oh, I was supposed to come here first. Um, and that was all I had really for today. We could talk, let's see, we have another 15 minutes. Okay, so let's see if we talk about apply. All right, does anybody have any theories about, okay, so there is a, a method we're gonna talk about called apply. Any theories about what that might do given just its name and that pretty little table right there? Right, so, so apply takes a method as an input and a column as an input and then applies the method to the column, okay? So that can be really handy. Um, and if I could actually see the computer screen. So first up, we're going to, okay, so, so we, we just constructed by hand a little table. Um, you know, with birth years and names. Um, I was thinking about changing all those to be like Archer or something that wasn't quite as tired as the office, but there you go. Um, so references to the office. 
Maybe I should have done Ben 10. That would have been hilarious. All right, but then I'm going to make a little function. Okay. Um, and I'm going to cap it at 19, right? So um, whatever the number is, uh, I want the minimum of uh, that, you know, birth year and 1980. Okay. Um, I probably had a decent idea of a good example of like why this is a scenario that might be interesting. But the idea is that you can now use our little function and no one can be older than what's 1980 that would be 41 41 right so no one can be wait no one can be older or no no one can be younger than 41 um so is that right yeah so 1975 so you get the minimum 1980, 1975. No one can be uh, any older than that. Uh, maybe this is uh, when you get your gold watch and you're expected to retire. So therefore they run this to uh, find out who should be, or sorry, the other way around. So anybody who's young, uh, older than 41 uh, should be retiring. Hopefully that is not true because I would be in trouble. All right, and then we you know, run it again. With a different one, just oh, and so a moment about testing. Um, it is usually a good idea to test kind of three different uh, kind of parameters for your map. Okay, one that's kind of lower or or you know longer or whatever than the thing you're expecting. One that's kind of higher or shorter or whatever you want to call it that, than the thing you're expecting, and then one that's exactly what you're expecting. So another good test here would be to send 1980. Okay. And then another one, if you're actually writing good code, is to send in something completely bizarre like which should result in something entertaining. Um, for some reason there's no minimum between nothing and 1980 um, because they're not comparable. So when you're testing something out to make sure your function is making sense, um, you know, just kind of even, uh, you know, just for fun or with formalized testing. Um, like I said, you basically te test kind of the above, below, and exact. And that's usually going to work. It's mostly 1980, right? Okay. So then we can do our apply function. And if you remember, I was saying before that a method name is really very much like any other variable name. So I can just plop it in here and it's gonna get passed around as a code block, okay? Um, this is not true of all languages. It is true of Python um, and most of the languages you probably interact with, um, but it's not true for all of them. So what's gonna happen here? Anyone ideas? What am I gonna what am I gonna get back and what's it gonna look like? Okay, but so what will I actually get back though? An array? All right, you think it's gonna be an array of the of the years? Okay. Anybody else? All right. And you would be correct, except obviously it's only the years that are before 1980 or 1980. It, for some reason, this is very, very hard for me to say. Um, so, that can be really useful right because so it's kind of like the um you know using like that sum function or the min max function or whatever except you can kind of do um any arbitrary thing to the entire array all at once or to the entire column all at once um so we can also do a slightly more sophisticated function so this one what's this one going to do
kind of like right there in the name. Right. So it's going to calculate their age and it's going to print name is X age, right? Um, but so now, that, oh, sorry, did I actually execute that? Um, so now I can apply that to um, the column, except, so we know this much, all right? Except now we need the names and the and the birth years, right? To be able to calculate the age. So thoughts on how you would do that? So Python is generally very forgiving in this regard. I am going to copy and paste it though because this is going to be hard for me to type. Um, you can very easily have just kind of more parameters. Okay, so. The thing to remember that's a little annoying here, right, is that that first column after the name of the method will be the first parameter, second column will be the second parameter, so you have to line them up, okay? And then we get a nice, you know, output of all the various strings that we want. So, as you might imagine, that's going to come in handy, right, when we want to do something, I don't know, maybe we want to figure out the average ages. Actually, I think in our next lecture, we're going to talk about a uh, prediction of people's height um, that was developed by a guy like 100 years ago. Um, so, I thought you were looking for protein fat. Oh, I think it's Galton. Galton, right? Yeah. I was like, isn't there, is there an S in there somewhere? Um, so, yeah. So, we're going to talk about uh, basically height prediction based on the parent's height. Uh, and so, and use this function to do that. Uh, any questions?